So we would exist in a, a form that was entirely transparent to any other, to, to basically any biological species, um, but we would very much exist. And so if you think about that, it suggests perhaps that there are vast numbers of intelligences, either in this universe or in other universes, that have reached that stage. And it almost certainly makes sense, right? We, we're certainly, it seems highly unlikely that even within this universe, that we are the most advanced. Uh, we likely sit in some kind of middle range. Uh, and so the question then is, is what do these other far more advanced intelligences look like? Do they look like little gray beings uh, that are flying around in little uh, metallic disks, uh, or do they exist in a form that we, we that would com be completely transparent to the, to our normal modes of communication? Hey, listeners, welcome back to Third Waves Podcast. We have a guest from Japan on the show today, all the way from Okinawa, Andrew Gallimore, who wrote Alien information theory, psychedelic drug technologies, and the cosmic game. And uh, Andrew is a computational neurobiologist, pharmacologist, chemist, and writer who has been interested in the neural basis of psychedelics for many years as, and is the author of a number of articles and research papers on the powerful psychedelic drug NN dimethyltryptamine DMT and its effects on the brain and consciousness. His current interests focuses on DMT as a tool for gait gating access to extra dimensional realities and how this can be understood in terms of the neuroscience of information. Andrew, welcome to the podcast. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. So you're in Okinawa. You've been there for six years now. You're originally, where yep. are you originally from? Um, from England, from the United Kingdom, of course. As you can tell by my accent, I guess. The greatest country in the world. Uh, that's it, yeah, still. <laughs> <laughs> where, in, where, where in the UK? London or? No, actually, originally I'm from a, um, a, a very old town called Lincoln. Not Lincoln, Nebraska. When I worked in America, uh, I used to say I was from Lincoln. I used to go, Nebraska? I was like, no, 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 no. Um, <laughs> Definitely not, not Lincoln, Nebraska. <laughs> Only in America would say that. But, Anyone else would hear your accent yeah. and immediately say, like, obviously. Anyway. Yeah, so a very old Roman town originally um, in the north, kind of the northeast of, uh, of the UK. Well, not that far northeast, but, but in the east. Um, yeah, so was it born there and grew up there and then moved around a little bit in the UK um, and then came to, um, Japan about almost seven years ago now. So you're from the Northeast of England. What brought you to Japan then? Why the, why the move over to Okinawa? Well, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, since I was a teenager, I've, I've kind of been fascinated by Japan and I, I tried to learn Japanese when I was like 15 years old. I told my German teacher that uh, I wanted to learn Japanese and he kind of laughed at me said, you know, nine, this guy, Nick, oh God, I can't speak German anymore. But um, <laughs> he, um, he said, <laughs> I, and he was right. I mean, I couldn't, I mean, I, I struggled. And this was before the internet, this was before you could immerse yourself using watching YouTube videos and stuff. So I had to buy books and tapes, tape, remember those. Um, and, um, but anyway, I, I dropped that. But then weirdly, I, I forgot about it. And then in about 2015, I was working at the University of York. I was working as a postdoc in computational neurobiology and kind of got to the end of my contract and I had no idea what I was going to do next uh, and kind of struggling. And then I noticed there was this, this funnily enough, this job opening in, in exactly the kind of same kind of field that I was working on in York um, in Okinawa. And so I, I dropped an email. I uh, thought this might be my chance to go to Japan and sent an email to the, um, to the professor here in Okinawa. And, um, a couple of weeks later I was on a plane, <laughs> um, for the interview. And then a couple of months later I was, uh, I moved here and that's been the case now, you know, that was, you know, 2015. So we're, we're pushing seven years in Okinawa now and, um, 
but coming to the end of my tenure in Okinawa and moving to Tokyo in in the next couple of months. So that's really the big kind of psychedelic city, uh, in my opinion. That's where the Tokyo, the, the center of the universe. I believe so. Yes, in many ways, it's a very. It's, people don't think of it. People think of Japan as being this very anti, um, uh, kind of an anti-drug country, and in many well, in many ways that's true. But there is. I, I can't help but feel that there's this very psychedelic undercurrent in, in, in Tokyo. There's something very almost DMT-esque about Tokyo. Um, the lights and the, the kind of uh, the, the cartoonish, uh, highly artificial construction. It, it feels like a DMT trip in a way, Tokyo. Um, so it's very, yeah, it's very apt, I think, uh, for me to be moving there finally. I feel very at home there. Weren't mushrooms legal there for a long time in Japan? Yes, I mean it's the same similar story as, as the UK. I mean the U, in the UK m- mushrooms were uh, were legal until I think it was around I forget the exact maybe like 2005 something like that. They used to be legal in an unprepared form. So you could pick them or you could fresh mushrooms were perfectly legal and then they closed the loophole as they say for no good reason. Uh really <clears throat> Not that they were causing any problems, and the same thing happened in Japan. They would mushrooms were sold in vending machines uh, around Shinjuku Station um, in the early two thousands. Until again, I think some idiotic J-pop idol had a bad experience on mushrooms, and it made the news. And the obvious response of all good governments is to make our lives way less fun. Make our lives way less fun. <laughs> yeah, That's exactly. Cool. Yeah. So, 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 so Japan has a, an inter- very interesting relationship to drugs. It's not, um, cannabis is completely bizarre, their relationship to cannabis. And that's a whole different story. But when it comes to Japan's attitude to drugs, um, it's very focused on methamphetamine. And there are very good historical reasons for why that's the case. Um, and cannabis, bizarrely. Um, but the other drugs, psychedelics, they don't really feature in the, the world of the Japanese lawmakers or the, the, the Japanese police. It's, it's all about meth and, and cannabis. So, so, so psychedelics, uh, there are a lot of people interested in psychedelics in Japan and it, it's not, and there are actually some ayahuasca circles I hear, I don't know their location or anything about them, uh, but I hear there are um, a number of ayahuasca circles because ayahuasca itself actually is, isn't illegal in Japan. Um, unlike in the UK, um, it's, it sits within this gray area of the law and where whole plants and whole plant preparations are not illegal. DMT is illegal, um, but the plant isn't illegal. It's the same with the San Pedro cactus. Um, That isn't illegal. Mescaline is illegal, but the San Pedro cactus isn't illegal. So you can can bring San Pedro cactus and trip on that in Japan uh, and remain completely within the law. So in so many ways, whilst people say, oh, Japan, it's the most anti-drugs country in the world or it has the harshest drug laws in the world, mm, that actually is not, not the case. Um, they have a very strong negative attitude to cannabis, which is bizarre, as I said, and kind of irrational. And it comes from the Americans, I dare say. Uh, so it's your fault. And, um, well, but why? when it comes why, to why psychedelics- is that? What's, what's the tie there? <laughs> Well, because cannabis, I mean, cannabis has a, there's a very long history of cannabis use in, in Japan. And certainly in historically it was grown, there are um, a number of areas in Japan where, where cannabis was grown and used uh, industrially, uh, used as a fabric, you know, as in many other parts of the world. Uh, and there's good evidence that, that it was also probably smoked and people have actually tested the the strains of cannabis that were growing in Japan in certain prefectures uh, before it was made very, very illegal and found that the, the levels of THC in these plants is actually higher than um, what was found in the United States back in the 60s. And not now, of course, because you, now it's all very, very super potent and highly kind of refined and 
um, optimized, right? Uh, but but back in the 1960s, levels were much lower, and 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 the cannabis that was being grown in Japan was actually a kind of similar levels. Now the problem came was after the the Second World War when America basically took over, at least temporarily, Japan, uh, and there is. It's not quite clear that the Cannabis Control Act came uh, was enacted, I think, in, in the early 1950s. And there's people say, although it isn't, you know, never really received a de- definitive account of this, that it was certainly the Americans that, that promoted that. Um, and, and weirdly, the, the Japanese have taken that to heart and they haven't really changed their position on it. The idea that cannabis is this, they have some very old fashioned ideas and rather discredited ideas about cannabis in terms of, you know, it being a gateway drug. And um, it's also associated with la- uh, laziness um, and non-productivity, which as you can imagine in Japan uh, is seen is is kind of an, an evil idea. The idea that you're going to be lazy and not contribute to society because it is a very productive and, and, and work ethic and that kind of thing is, is, is held in very, uh, in high, high esteem really. So, so the idea of, so this, the idea that, uh, of a, a drug that would diminish that is taken rather seriously. Um, so yeah, so, and a methamphetamine, of course, Japan had a huge problem with that from, from immediately after the second world war, the after the end of the second world war when the the methamphetamine that was heavily used by the japanese military during the war was kind of flooded the black market uh, or then what was really a gray market because methamphetamine was 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 legal then uh, and they had a, a huge problem with lots of these mum kind of mum and pop i guess you would call them methamphetamine production facilities, which were often just two people, you know, a little farmhouse making meth. You know, it's kind of breaking bad stuff from the 1950s. Oh. It's kind of kind of cool. Uh, and so they they kind of cracked down on this. And what was it doing? What what um, effect was it having on society? Well, people were initially it was seen as this cure for basically the opposite of what cannabis was seen as. It was seen as the cure for for laziness and, and, and lassitude and depression and sleepiness and all these things that you would think that the, you can just imagine the Japanese embracing, right? We have this drug that can make you work for longer and longer. Uh, and so it became very, very popular um, very, very quickly. And the problem with that, of course, is that when people start overusing methamphetamine, then you start to see with a delay, you start to see negative psychological effects and you, you get kind of cannabis, not cannabis, sorry, like methamphetamine psychosis and you get all of and, uh, an addiction and people becoming dependent and undergoing uh, these negative psychological changes, uh, physiological changes, behavioral changes uh, because of the overuse of methamphetamine. Um, so, so that became a problem and they didn't really know what to do with it. Uh, and so this is when the the stimulant control act so there's basically th- three big laws in japan there's the stimulant control act which is basically against meth there's the cannabis control act and then you have the the opium control act um and then there's an, another one there's one more which covers everything else it's kind of like schedule b if you like and this is where all the psychedelics sit so they they don't sit actually in the like in sh- in, in schedule or so schedule one Schedule. I'm thinking of class B and yeah, in the UK we have class A and class B. So class A is schedule one equivalent. Um, whereas in Japan you have these three schedule one laws for the specific drugs, cannabis, meth, and, um, opium or heroin, you know, opiates. And then you have this huge other law, which is kind of like schedule B, which has everything, everything else is kind of lumped into that. And this is where the psychedelics sit. Uh. I have a question for you. So the British mm. imported opium, smokable opium into China, which created a many lasting effects <laughs> in terms of yeah. that whole thing. Did that also affect Japan? Was Japan also, was there a lot of opium imported and that's why they passed the Opium Act? Oh, this was a huge thing. So so at the turn of the, the 20th century, China, this is following kind of the Sino-Japanese war, which Japan won. And... 
Japan at the time, <coughs> excuse me, um, at the time Japan saw opium addiction, which was again very prevalent in in China at the time. They saw that as a sign of a great weakness. Um, and that they felt that the Chinese were little more than animals because they were addicted to opium. They were weak. These were uh, a, a very low form of human being and, and uh, a completely dysfunctional society. And the Japanese felt that a prerequisite, really, for a uh, uh, for a, a, a civilized society uh, was abstinence and resistance to addiction by opium, uh, addiction to opium. Um, and so, so, so opium was very, very strongly demonized in the early parts of the 20th century by Japan. And weirdly, uh, Japan actually thought that the increasing use of alcohol at the time, so whiskey and beer basically, was a sign of becoming a more progressive civilization. Japan wanted to separate itself from the, the rest of the Orient, i.e. China, basically, and distinguish itself as a more civilized nation and more like the West. It wanted to be more like uh, the British Empire, more like uh, America. Uh, and the way to do that was, was to... Um, uh, was to demonize opium and 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 to basically claim that its people were resistant to addiction. Uh, that there's something about the Japanese constitution, you know, physical, you know, the Japanese physiology, the the Japanese psyche that made them resistant, more resistant to drug addiction than these um, these very weak um, Chinese people um, just across the just across the water. Um, which, which is also why when, after the Second World War, when all of these Japanese people started becoming addicted to methamphetamine, they could never deny, they couldn't deny it anymore. They couldn't, it, 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 it was no longer a problem of the other, uh, i.e. a problem of, of Chinese people. It became a problem of the self. You know, the, the Japanese people realized that they too were becoming uh, addicted to or large numbers of their population were becoming addicted to and they they felt i mean japanese was obviously a very defeated nation post second world war and they saw this increase in methamphetamine addiction as being a uh, a sign of the the disintegration of their society you know, smoke you know taking methamphetamine the the japanese felt was a sign um, uh, that was an existential threat they felt that it was a sign that their their entire nation which is obviously hugely important to the japanese then and still now for that matter um, and that that people who used methamphetamine were were contributing to the 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 collapse, the destruction, the disintegration of, of the Japanese nation. So you can imagine why the response was so strong and why that, um, that kind of echoes, if you like, through the decades and why Japanese people still are very fearful about quote unquote drugs uh, is because they, they do, they still feel and that, that, it, that it is, it's not just a kind of a personal choice to use drugs, um, but that actually, when people use drugs, they are actually threatening, almost, threatening the Japanese nation. So you have to understand, it's easy to say, oh, and, you know, obviously I would agree that most drug laws, uh, criminalization of drugs is, is irrational and does more harm than good. Uh, it's, it, it's useful, I think, to try and get inside the mind of those people that, that do want to criminalize drugs and do see them as evil and try to understand, get to the bottom of why they think like that. Uh, that's the only way you're ever going to find some kind of common ground, I think. Well, we could talk about history all day, is my sense. And I want to <laughs> I want to start to get into aliens because <laughs> sure. what's more interesting than history and aliens <laughs> and right. DMT? So yeah. I'd love to first, what's, what, how do you define alien intelligence is where I would start? <clears throat> Um, well, I don't necessarily define it as beings from other planets. I think the, the classical idea of a, an alien being a little gray, gray skinned being from elsewhere in, in, in our universe, I would define it as uh, any intelligence that's, uh, either not from this earth or perhaps not from this universe. 
um, that would be an alien. So I use the word, I use the term alien in a, in a very broad sense. I don't, I, I, I don't have the necessarily all of these other connotations. You know, even you know what people might call spirits or angels or uh, elves. These would all be kind of forms of alien intelligence. If, you know, if they existed. So how does DMT then help you tap into this alien intelligence, this multi-dimensional sort of awareness? Uh, yeah, well, that's that's the question that I've been wrestling with for the last couple of decades is is how is it possible that when you you ingest this simple plant alkaloid, I mean this plant alkaloid that's scattered throughout the um, throughout the plant kingdom and is, and is ubiquitous really throughout the, the plant kingdom. How is it possible that when this enters the brain, it, it, it somehow allows you to access to uh, these, these very, very, very strange realms and these very curious and intelligent and what seem to be very intelligent and powerful um, alien intelligences, you know, what's actually going on there. And I think the, the difficulty in answering that question is, well, the difficulties are manifold, really. But I mean, certainly the, the questions are often poorly framed in the first place. People, um, there's there's a ten, there's an initial tendency just to say, well, it's just hallucination. That's all that's happening. Your brain is constructing it. Your brain is making it up. Uh, but but from a neuroscientific perspective, that's actually difficult to justify. Knowing knowing what we know anyway about the way that the brain works. Um, so if, if it's not hallucination, then the alternative is that you, you, or one of the alternatives is that you're dealing with some kind of intelligence that exists independently of your mind. That's, I guess that's one way of putting it, uh, but not necessarily. It could also be deeply embedded somehow within the structure of, of your psyche. And that's another possibility, which we could get into. Um, but the question really is, in, in my opinion, is if if there is some other realm, or if there are other realms, other universes, other dimensions, whatever you want to call it, the question really is: is is how does DMT gate the flow of information from those those realms? Because it's all about the flow of information. You, when you observe the world now, what's happening is there's a there's a, a flow of information from that from the outside world into your brain via the sensory apparatus. You'd never directly access, you never directly kind of reach out and touch the external world. It's always the flow of information entering the brain, which then the brain then, which then modulates the, the world that the brain is already constructing. So your brain is always constructing a, a model uh, and that model is modulated by information flowing into the brain. So visual information, sound information, these are all, of course, converted to um, electrochemical signals, which the brain then uses to kind of refine and update its model on a real time, um, on a real time basis. And so, so if you want to access other realms of reality, other dimensions, what has to happen is the DMT has to somehow gate the flow of information uh, as a kind of an alternate form of sensory information, if you like, uh, gate the flow of information from those realms and thus allowing your brain to kind of construct a model of that uh, other reality. So, so you, the world that you experience is always a model. It's always a model that your brain is constructing based upon noisy patterns of incomplete information. And, and I, I don't see any reason why that's different in the DMT state. Your brain is, is constructing the DMT world. And that's an, another important point that people miss. People think that it's a choice between the DMT world being real and your brain constructing it. No, your brain is always constructing the world that you experience. The question is, is, uh, is, is that world being modulated by some extrinsic, some external information source. In other words, is there some other realm where these beings exist um, from which the information is reaching the brain somehow? And, and if so, um, what is DMT actually doing? We know that DMT is perturbing the brain. It's perturbing the information that the brain generates. Um, and how does that then allow it to receive information 
from um, from this other place. And you might think like uh, that in the same way as you might change the the way that a let's say a a wine glass resonates um, based upon its shape. Um, it would resonate with certain frequencies of sound. And we've all seen or heard about the opera singer who can sing and cause a glass to vibrate and shatter if you get the frequency right. So you get this resonance effect. So, so it's, it's, it, it's almost like there's, there's something similar going on there in, in that what DMT is doing is changing the patterns of information that the brain generates, um, somehow allowing it to tune in, if you like, uh, to patterns of information uh, that come from elsewhere, but we we certainly don't understand how that works and, and how there could be this transfer of information from places, you know, not just outside of Earth, but actually beyond um, what we would normally recognise as the limits of our of our, of our reality. Terence McKenna wrote about mm-hmm. UFOs and aliens and the Archaic Revival, mm-hmm. which was a collection of essays, talks, many other things. I'm curious, you know, you, you seem to like Terrence McKenna and Mm. his philosophy. What, how, uh, yeah. What was that like for you? What, what, how would you see him as a mentor in terms of how you've developed this framework around alien information theory? Um, Well, I think anyone who's interested in DMT um, is interested in Terence McKenna to some extent, or at least was at one point. And I think f- for me, back in the the late '90s, when I was first becoming interested in DMT, it was it was Terence McKenna that, in, that kind of introduced me. Uh, and this was from his books, from the Archaic Revival, from particularly from True, True Hallucinations, as well as the Invisible Landscape. And um, Terence McKenna is. In Terence McKenna is an ideas man, and I, I kind of like that. He's when you listen to Terence McKenna talk, it's like watching a piece of flint roll down a, a mountain, and there's these sparks of ideas that come off him. Um, the ways of looking at the world, the ways of thinking about um, the, the the meaning uh, and structure of, of, of the psychedelic state uh, is completely unique in my opinion, or certainly was at the time. Um, and, and so that, that's been a, it's kind of a, a very strong influence uh, on me. And particularly, you know, at the beginning of my, the introduction to my book, Alien Information Theory, um, I, I, I quote McKenna and he says that uh, the important thing to realize or is that we are imprisoned in some kind of work of art. The idea that reality itself, our reality is this, constructed artifact in some way, you know, a, a work of art and we are embedded within it. Uh, and uh, which seems like a very strange idea, but also quite uh, deeply profound when you think about it. The idea that we are trapped within this very thin slice of reality, uh, this thin slice of this much, much larger and more complex structure and that DMT somehow is modulating the way that we interact with that larger structure. This is a this is a very kind of Terence McKenna esque idea, or at least goes back to that. So, um, you know, Terence McKenna never looked at things from the the obvious angle. He always he always had a completely different perspective uh, to these things, and and indeed. To you know, you mentioned aliens and UFOs. Um, a- Terence McKenna rarely spoke about uh, little shimmering metallic discs arriving, or really, you know, as being physical objects that arrive from other star systems. But always thought of them as being something else, uh, whether it's uh, um, fragments of the human psyche that have become somehow autonomous. Uh, and, and he spoke about this as well, the idea of the elves being these autonomous psychic complexes, which comes from, from Carl Jung, which he was very interested in, um, and, 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 and many other topics. So he was uh, a massive influence on me. Uh, uh, and, and I guess I learned a lot about how to think about 
psychedelics, um, how to think differently about psychedelics than many other people do. Um, I, I got from Terence McKenna. What are your five most influential books or five books that were really influential in writing alien information theory, developing sort of uh, anything like that? Um, that's a good question. So let me think here. This is a difficult one. So, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Let me think here. Um, yeah, you need to give me a moment. Yeah, review, review your Goodreads. Do you use Goodreads? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's just that. So you mean specifically for alien or, information or theory? Generally, like what what are five books that come to mind that are in, that have been inspiring for you or interesting or influential? Kind of like I'm sure you got some good ones. So I guess off the cuff. So the mm, mm, mm. so I guess the in terms of psychedelics um <laughs> Yeah. Have a look here. So I think, so obviously I'm, we'll leave the, the Terence McKenna aside, um, but there, I guess the, the two most influential, maybe the three, I guess, most influential authors for me, one of them would be uh, a guy called Stuart Kaufman. Have you heard of Stuart Kaufman? I have not. Tell us about Stuart. So, so Stuart Kaufman is a, he's a fascinating character. He's, I think, originally a mathematician, but he's really a complexity theory, theorist um, and, and wrote a lot about the emergence of complexity and how, uh, how simple systems can um, self-complexify to form larger, uh, more complex um, systems with emergent functions. And, and Alien Information Theory is, is a book about how um, kind of the the idea that at the ground of reality there is a very low level simple digital system uh, that it's running according to very very simple rules and these very s- simple individual base units of reality if you like are interacting uh, and self complexifying and self organizing uh, and then it kind of through these levels of hierarchical organization and, and the top of that sits. Um, sits complex, intelligent life such as ourselves. So Kaufman uh, was a was a great influence there, as was Stuart um, um, Edelman, uh, who won the Nobel Prize for uh, I think for his work in immunology. Um, but then Edelman moved to looking at the brain and and how the brain the uh, generates complexity and how the brain generates information and so all of this is is really kind of fundamental to my uh, to my kind of world view if you like is thinking about how the brain um constructs itself really and and, and how the brain constructs its model of reality um so i guess those would be my um and Stephen uh, Wolfram, of course. I mean, you know about Stephen Wolfram. I don't know about um, Stephen. Tell us about Stephen. Yeah, Stephen Wolfram. He wrote, um, he was the architect of Mathematica, um, the, the software, the very, very important mathematical software. And I, th- I think he was anyway. Um, um, but he, anyway, he wrote a book called um, A New Kind of Science, which is based upon the idea of cellular automata, these very simple systems, binary digital systems uh, that interact uh, and, and generate highly complex behavior from very, very simple rules. Uh, he wrote a very thick book about you know 1,200 pages called A New Kind of Science. And, and his... his uh, he claims that all of reality could be um, at the lowest level, as I, as, I, as I just said, could be this very, very simple digital system that's running this very simple deterministic um, cellular automaton, this very low level digital system that it self organizes and self complexifies and produces all of the complex phenomena that we see in the world. So he's, this is called digital physics, this idea. 
the idea that this, the, the, the fundamental nature of reality is, is, is digital. Uh, and he's one of the, the great proponents of, of digital physics. So he was kind of quite influential as well. Um, and then, but then a, a kind of aside from all of that, I, uh, I uh, kind of my, I also read a lot of novels, of course, as, as all intelligent people should do. And I guess, um, people like Herman Hesse, um, and, uh, Cormac McCarthy, uh, even, even Kerouac, I have a very, uh, a soft spot for him, uh, that I can't, that I can't shake. Uh, I'm in, I'm interested in. Um, uh, renegades is not quite the word, but I'm interested in people who who think differently to to everyone else, uh, and, and who seem to have tapped into some um, some kind of profundity uh, uh, at the ground of reality, and some profundity in terms of of uh, uh, of what what we are and what we're doing here, and the the meaning of all of that. And Alan Watts, of course, who cannot love Alan Watts and his books have been uh, a great source of inspiration and, um, and comfort really, um, as we kind of make our way through this rather strange, um, world. <laughs> precisely, precisely. A yeah. rather strange world. What's your take on the metaverse? Mm. Yeah. Um, I don't really have a take yet. Oh, uh, that's... No take is developed. Okay. All right. What are your initial thoughts? Yeah, no about, take, what are your initial thoughts about the metaverse? Then? Uh, well, I mean, Mark, what's his name? Mark Zuckerberg. Is that his name? That's okay. Yeah, it's early. Uh, yeah, Mark Zuckerberg. Anything that he does kind of creeps me out, to be honest. I mean, there's something about him that I find just innately rather strange and creepy. And so if it was somebody else who was proposing this, other than Mark Zuckerberg, then... then uh, I might find it more interesting, but I don't find him a particularly interesting character. I find him, I find him utterly banal. Um, and uh, he kind of sits in the uncanny valley, you know, the uncanny valley between human and, and, and robot. He kind of sits in that uncanny valley. Um, so, so no, I don't, I don't find, to be honest, I don't really find these Silicon Valley types, very particularly interesting people. Um, you know, since we lost Steve Jobs, I, I don't, I find them all rather banal and samey and I don't find anything that they have to say any more particularly interesting. I find it all rather sinister actually. Um, so, so yeah, I wouldn't, the idea of a metaverse, right? So the idea of, I mean, do you remember Second Life? It rings a bell. Yeah, Second Life, I think. So let me, let me get it straight. So the metaverse is the idea that there's like an alternate place where humans can have their kind of avatars, right? Where they can interact and live like a second life within this, this, this other space. Right. Right. Um, and sec second life was a computer game. I think, Oh, uh, is it 10, 15 time flies, but it was a similar idea where you could exist. You would have a second life within the computer game. And, and this is, a, I think this is a really interesting idea. I mean, fundamentally, this is a really cool idea. The idea that you could be, that somehow extant within uh, an alternate virtual space, uh, perhaps without all of the constraints that that one has in in in, in real life, so to speak. And then, as w if you take that idea to its um, to its extreme, you can imagine actually dispensing, ultimately dispensing with the material form completely, and and in a sense, uh, uploading ourselves or transferring ourselves. And again, I talk about this in Alien Information Theory, transferring if we could somehow transfer our consciousness into this alternate space um, where there wouldn't be the the restrictions of this having to kind of do it do do it on meat, so to speak, um, do. Uh, kind of instantiate ourselves in this very delicate and um, not very long lasting um, physical material, this very wet gelatinous thing called the brain. Uh, if we could somehow instantiate this consciousness, instantiate the, the neural architecture um, in a purely digital system, then that might 
that would, in a sense, be the metaverse. We we would, in a sense, be, become um, become immortal, really. And and this this I guess it's a bit tangential, but this idea that ultimately human beings will discover a means of dispensing with their physical organism, um, their physical state, I think is is one that has been discussed for for decades now and and astrobiologists and uh, other biologists and, and intelligence theorists and neuroscientists have have or cer- a certain subset of these people have been thinking about what is the ultimate aim for humanity you know Terence McKenna used to talk about reaching you know setting off for the stars but I, I see that really as in a perhaps in a, in a literal sense, but also in a kind of a metaphorical sense in that humans will actually not just set off from leave the earth in a physical sense, but would also leave the material world, will, will cast off the, their, their physical body and instantiate themselves in a, a digital space. Uh, and, and so we would become... Uh, a type of post-human intelligence. And Paul Davies, who's a, a kind of a prominent physicist who's written, is very interested in aliens and these kind of things. He's written lots of excellent books, by the way, while we're talking about books. So Paul Davies suggests, and others have suggested that this, when it comes to intelligent life, um, you can kind of think about it as as happening in three phases. You have the long phase kind of pre-intelligence. So this is very basic forms of life, um, all the way up to kind of human. So this is the kind of life that is unable to perform complex tasks, and, uh, or at least intelligently perform complex tasks, and uh, is unable to, to, to conceive of the idea of you know, how their brain is constructed and what intelligence is and all of that. So this is the kind of the pre, the pre-technological phase, if you like, of an intelligent, uh, the, of the evolution of an intelligence. Then you enter what you might call the technological phase, which is what we're in now, which is where we become aware of ourselves. We become aware of our intelligence. We become, a, we start to learn how our intelligence is constructed. We learn about how uh, intelligence is instantiated, and, uh, and and then we begin to conceive of the idea of of of, of becoming more than human, becoming post-human, uh, and that's likely to be a very narrow temporal range, a very short period of time, perhaps just a few hundred years, and then you enter the post-human age. So once humans um, discover the means or the possibility of dispensing with their physical form, it's probably only a, a few hundred years until they actually achieve that. Uh, and then you enter, then you become post-biological. So not just post-human, but actually post-biological. So you dispense with the, the constraints of a cellular biological form and somehow instantiate oneself in a digital form. Whether that means, it doesn't necessarily mean kind of running huge data centers on on Mars or something, but discovering how perhaps to instantiate oneself deep within the, the structure of reality itself. So, so perhaps, you know, if, if reality really is fundamentally a digital structure, being able to manipulate that uh, and and really run computations at this lowest level of, of reality and being, being able to actually instantiate our intelligence and our consciousness uh, within this ground of reality. And so we would exist in a, a form that was entirely transparent to any other, to, to basically any biological species, um, but we would very much exist. And so if you think about that, it suggests perhaps that there are vast numbers of intelligences, either in this universe or in other universes, that have reached that stage. And it almost certainly makes sense, right? We're certainly, it seems highly unlikely that even within this universe, that we are the most advanced. Uh, We likely sit in some kind of middle range. Uh, And so the question then is, is 
what do these other far more advanced intelligences look like? Do they look like little gray beings uh, that are flying around in little uh, metallic disks? Uh, or do they exist in a form that we, we that would com- be completely transparent to the, to our normal modes of communication, right? Um, so these will be post biological, and it and if that's possible for an intelligence to become post biological, it makes sense or seems probable um, that the vast amount of intelligence in this universe is probably post biological, is probably in outside of this very narrow window that we exist within now. All the intelligences before that we can forget about because we can't even communicate with those. They can't conceive of other intelligences elsewhere in the universe. Uh, But the idea of focusing our search for alien intelligence on this very narrow band that we're in now of of basically wet brained biological uh, um, organisms is probably very, very short-sighted. And we should perhaps be focusing on our attention on these post-biological intelligences that uh, perhaps are far, far more numerous throughout our universe and perhaps other universes. They may have discovered a means to escape or transcend our universe in some way. And then it's the whole thing starts to loop back and you start thinking about, wait, wait a minute, what's DMT doing here? You know, what if 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 DMT is allowing us to access some kind of intelligence, is this some kind of post-biological intelligence? Is it an intelligence that has either existed once in our universe and has somehow reached the post-biological stage and can continue to advance? Uh, uh, which is perhaps why the DMT space, it does feel very, very, very old in a way, but not old as in a kind of an old fashioned or um, um, that kind of sense, Um, but old as in it's been around much, much longer than our universe and is much more advanced. It seems inordinately technological um, compared to our universe. And so it does make you think that maybe we are accessing, there's nothing magical about DMT as such, but it's somehow it's allowing us to access one of these post-biological intelligences, one of these post-biological realities that have, have simply existed for far longer than our relatively young universe and that that we that we are real really are kind of neophyte intelligences within um within a uh, a system of, of much older and much more advanced and complex intelligences and that dnt is somehow gating access to those you know a lot of what i'm hearing is i'm going to tie this into a few things there's 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 a fundamental worldview or a metaphysical v- perspective, a shift that happens mm. in our in, in our metaphysical perspective as a result of psychedelic use. There was this recent research published maybe a month or two ago. Um, it helps people to be, or people become more pantheistic, I think, is the the orientation, these, mm-hmm. these paganistic values. I'm really interested in Gnosis, Gnosticism. Just read this fantastic book called Not in His Image by John Lamlash about um, the, the Gnostic teachings in ancient Egypt and ancient Greece and, you know, how they stem from the Persians and the Magi, et cetera, et cetera. Do you feel like humans and post-humans can coexist or will it simply be that we all evolve into this higher stage of intelligence? Will there be choice in that? In other words, if there are people who want to stay in their physical organism because they enjoy the experience and it's really interesting, can they choose to do that? Well, yeah, this is, this is difficult because it's, um, you, you get a lot of pushback and resistance, the idea of kind of post-humanism or even transhumanism, right? And this, and the archaic revival was very much uh, I feel there's this kind of tension mm-hmm. and that, and that's kind of reflected a lot in Terence McKenna's writings as well. In one sense, uh, you know, in one breath, he's talking about going back to the, uh, you know, the archaic, you know, the archaic revival, going back to the jungle, reconnecting 
with the natural world, with plant intelligence, um, the intelligence of the earth. Um, and then in the in the next breath, he's talking about getting on a spaceship or, 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 or dismantling our human form and entering, setting off for the stars. You know, it, it feels like there's this tension here, and reasonably so, I think. Um, there is a a justifiable concern about where our technology and uh, is taking us and i guess it's the old uh, fight between the conservatives and the progressives there's the the progressives who say let's go go you know let's go forward march forward you know new world ahead um and then the conservatives say wait a minute let's try and you know let's try and preserve some of these things that we've built over the last centuries they could be they're quite important um and and that you have to kind of find this balance Right, and 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 we're we're talking about that on a a a, a a a species level scale, a different kind of scale. The I this this tension between should we, the, you know, all of the problems that come with a tech or, or, or certainly our technological civilization, and that we we seem to be destroying our our home, our, our planet, and so there's a you know with our technology and and. Uh, but that I guess one could argue that that's that's misuse of the technology. I think technology isn't inherently it's certainly not inherently evil. It's certainly not inherently destructive. And it should be the opposite, of course. it should it should preserve. It should help us to to work more efficiently, um, uh, to waste less, to produce less pollution. but it, but of course, you know, yeah, I mean that's a whole di- different. We're going through some uh, transitions there, but I get I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, saying. yeah. right, right. So uh, yeah, we're going through some kind of some transitions there, and 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 so, uh, in the one hand, there are these people who think that we should be we should be uh, going back to a more archaic state. We should be getting more in touch with Mother Earth. You know, they refer to it as Mother Earth, and 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 with the plant intelligences, with the plant spirits, and and this kind of more. <laughs> shamanistic shall we say worldview and Higgins. then there's the yeah. then there's the, the the transhumanists or the posthumanists who mm. would like to see us dispense with um the material form completely and you know upload our intelligences onto a computer and in a sense they're not they're not completely incompatible because of course if we were to leave the earth physically or in some other way then the earth would probably flourish quite nicely without us um so it, it's it's not an entirely selfish enterprise that suggests that we should you know that the earth is the cradle of mankind as terence penny used to say the earth is the cradle of mankind but one cannot remain in the cradle forever and we it we we we, we seem to be a species that has outgrown the cradle uh, we have our um you know our, what what we construct, the kind of worlds that we construct, the way that we modify the earth and the buildings, the architecture, uh, the stuff that we make, the, the technologies that we develop, that they they seem completely disjoint from the natural world. They, we seem to be. I write in the first chapter of Alien Information Theory. We 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 seem to be drawn um, ineluctably towards the stars. We we are. We feel this connection to the alien. We feel drawn towards the alien. We feel like we are becoming the alien. And that is represented uh, or reflected, should I say, in the kind of things that we construct, you know, iPhones and um, skyscrapers and uh, computer systems. All of this is very, un- it feels very unnatural. Uh, it feels like we are we are separating ourselves dislocating ourselves from the natural world uh, in a very profound and perhaps uh, irreversible sense and that must and that is clearly very frightening um cutting the the apron strings if you like from from earth from the natural world and entering our post human stage becoming the alien taking the next step towards becoming that, the kind of post-biological intelligence perhaps that we meet in the DMT space. Perhaps it's the fate of an intelligent species that makes it far enough, that doesn't destroy itself on the way. Perhaps it is the ultimate fate. 
uh, of them to di- to um, to to lose the the biological form, as I said, and enter into a post biological existence, uh, and and that we're in that very difficult phase where we're kind of looking back and going, oh, do we really want to go? You know, there's no going back now. You know, this is it. We can either do this or we can just go back to uh, playing in the trees, which is not necessarily a bad thing to do, by the way. Um, but we have to, at some point, we have to make that choice, clearly. Make the um, leap. You know, we have to make that leap. And and the, the bridges will be burned, I think. I don't think you, we can go back. Uh, we can construct a reality for ourselves outside of Earth. And it could be a, an incredibly beautiful and complex and dynamic and malleable um, kind of reality, the kind of space that you go to when you, when you smoke DMT. Uh, but then our earthly uh, existence, you know, the garden of our garden of Eden time would be very much over, I think. Wow. Great ending point. (laughs) So, um, Andrew Gallimore, author of alien information theory, psychedelic drug technologies in the cosmic game. I see you just republished it. It looks like in May, 2021. Yeah, so I, uh, the the first edition was hardback edition. This is nice. there's a a, a a paperback edition, softback edition as well now, and there's also a Kindle version as well. So people like to read on their iPad or something. I mean, it is full color um, throughout with lots of diagrams, so it's not good for a regular Kindle. But if you've got like oh. an iPad or something, you can you can read it in that form. It'd be a cool Some book to prefer have. the digital oh. age, the digital dispensing age. with the the paper form. I'm gonna order. I'm gonna order the hardback now. Usually, if I buy things like this, it's. Um, I like to have it. I'm one of those weird people who still carries my books around with me, and if and with I the ones, prefer books. Yeah, yeah, but the ones I yeah, don't yeah, carry yeah. on me with me, I send back to my parents' house still because I don't actually have a home. I'm I'm constantly moving to new places, but I still yeah. Books are heavy. Books, books are heavy. Books man. are heavy. They're fucking heavy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. crazy. Yeah. Good to have. Well. Um, it's 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 been a pleasure. This was really fun. I'm glad we got to um, hang for a while and talk. Awesome. All right. See you on Twitter. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Thanks so much for watching. If you want to stay up to date on the third wave of psychedelics, subscribe to this channel and visit the thethirdwave.co, where you'll find plenty of free resources on intentional and responsible psychedelic use.